The past two years have been particularly challenging for the global economy. The IMF has closely worked with member countries to alleviate the far-reaching economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and now spillovers from the war in Ukraine. Yet another global crisis is looming as the threat posed by climate change to long-term growth and prosperity becomes ever more pressing as the time goes by. At the IMF, we have stepped up our work on climate mitigation, adaptation, and transition to a low carbon economy. We are integrating the climate agenda in the full range of IMF activities, from research and analytical work to policy advice, technical assistance, and training. And we are now pleased to launch a new free and open online course on the macroeconomics of climate change, which will allow not only government officials, but also the general public to get access to the latest economic knowledge on climate change. This course offers a framework to understand policy issues at the intersection of macroeconomics and climate. It will help learners identify why, when, and how climate change is macrocritical, engage in high-level discussions on macroeconomic and financial stability and climate issues, and understand the data and resources that we have at the IMF. Today's peek into training will give you a glimpse into the online course. I encourage you to enroll and contribute to the transformation of our world as we tackle climate change. You will be joining a global community of more than 130,000 active learners who have benefited from IMF courses. Let me take this opportunity to thank the government of Japan for its support for the IMF online learning program, as well as all our other partners in our capacity building work. With that, I hand it over to you, Irene and Chen, for today's live interactive session. Thank you, First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath, for launching today's Peek into Training. During this hour, we will peel back the curtain and give you a glimpse into a few of the climate change issues we all need to understand to have meaningful policy discussions. The training that you will see today is the result of the collective effort of committed IMF staff across various departments. Today's event is an interactive live session. It will feature video clips from the IMF's Macroeconomics of Climate Change course, now available on edX. We will also invite you to answer questions via Mentimeter. Go to menti.com and enter the code 47323038 on the top bar of the screen to play along. Let's begin with the mechanisms through which climate change impacts the economy. High greenhouse gas emissions are the main contributor to global warming. Rising temperatures cause our climate to have real and sometimes severe socioeconomic impacts as a result. Ultimately, this could undermine macroeconomic and financial stability. Some of you might be wondering how high are the economic costs of climate change? So let me ask you this question in our first poll. What is the average impact of extreme natural disasters on annual GDP per capita worldwide? Is it 0.5 percentage points, 1 percentage point, or 1.5 percentage points? Let's see what our audience has to say. We see that the responses are coming in, and we hope a couple of additional respondents will join before the clock times out. It appears that responses are split. Well, in fact, let's see what you think. The answer is 1.0 percentage points of GDP, which is what half our respondents answered. That is equivalent to about three quarters of a trillion dollars. But it is worth noting that the impacts of climate change are not evenly distributed. As my colleague Augustus will explain, vulnerable countries are much harder hit. For developing countries with limited resources, the effects of climate change, including mass migration and conflicts, can be compounded. For example, due to limited adaptation capacities, 
developing countries are likely to experience long-lasting impacts of short-term weather anomalies, slower economic recovery following natural disasters, and greater vulnerability to future shocks. This underscores why, at the IMF, we see three types of climate-related policy challenges as falling within our mandate. Two are domestic policy challenges, which the IMF covers as part of the bilateral surveillance that informs our country reports, which you may know as Article 4 consultations. First, many countries need to adapt to climate change. For example, they need to invest in infrastructure that is resilient to disruptive weather patterns. And they need to manage the consequences of climate change, such as migration and resettlement. Often these policy challenges have fiscal and other macroeconomic implications. Second, almost all countries need to transition to a low carbon economy. Many countries must meet nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, which requires changes to fiscal, structural, and regulatory policies. Oil exporters will suffer from reduced demand for their exports and will need to manage that transition as well. A third policy challenge is global, mitigating climate change. This calls for global action to limit or offset the emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. No country can mitigate climate change on its own, but some countries have a greater impact on the global effort. During our multilateral surveillance, IMF staff assesses whether one country's policies trigger potentially destabilizing spillovers in other countries. Then we discuss options to contain those spillovers. Climate change mitigation policies can trigger such spillovers, particularly for countries that are large emitters of greenhouse gases. Let's discuss these mitigation and adaptation challenges in greater detail. Chen, over to you. Thank you, Irene. Let me begin with the policy challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emission to mitigate climate change. Signatories of the 2015 Paris Agreement agreed to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Meeting these targets requires cutting greenhouse gas emission globally by 25 to 50% by 2030 and reaching global carbon neutrality by 2050. Countries need to work collectively, but their policy solutions do not need to be the same. Let's see what my colleague Ian has to say. Countries will need comprehensive mitigation strategies, which should include a package of mitigation instruments. Carbon pricing should be the centerpiece, but supporting measures in the main energy sectors and pricing of broader emissions are also needed. Let's unpack that a bit more. Here's Ian again on carbon pricing. The basic rationale for carbon pricing is that it promotes all behavioral responses for reducing emissions across the energy sector as the carbon price is reflected in higher prices for fossil fuels, electricity, and energy intensive products. These responses include reducing driving, shifting to electric vehicles and to cleaner gasoline and diesel vehicles, reducing building emissions, industrial emissions, and electricity demand, shifting from coal and gas to renewables and power generation, and other fuel switching to reduce the CO2 intensity of power generation, for example, from coal to gas and from these fuels to nuclear. Carbon pricing also strikes the cost-effective balance across these responses as the marginal cost of reducing emissions, which equals the carbon price, is equated across these responses. Carbon pricing should be the centerpiece of mitigation strategies because it is the most efficient policy tool for reaching mitigation goals. To help us think through how a policymaker might consider the impacts of carbon pricing on the economy and households, we turn to a hypothetical country example. The Republic of Mitigation is based on our work in a real IMF member country. The Republic of Mitigation is an emergent economy. It is one of the 20 largest greenhouse gas emitters. 
Energy-related CO2 emissions account for three quarters of total emissions, about 90% of its primary energy supply and 80% of its power generation come from fossil fuels. Over the next decade, its GDP is projected to grow by 25% in real terms, while the carbon intensity of GDP is expected to decline by 13%. But the Republic of Mitigation is also serious about meeting its nationally determined contribution targets. So it has been considering a carbon pricing scheme that gradually increases carbon prices from $20 per ton of CO2 to 75 per ton by 2030. So Irene, what does that mean for the economy? Thanks, Chen. Let's go back to menti.com so I can ask our audience what they think. To work through the economic impacts, Let's suppose that policymakers opt for a carbon pricing scheme involving a simple carbon tax. And let's recall that the Republic of Mitigation still depends heavily on fossil fuels for its energy supply and power generation. So a carbon tax in this case will mean higher fossil fuel prices. What is the impact of the carbon tax on energy consumption in the Republic of Mitigation over the medium term? We have the following options. Do you think energy consumption will decrease? That energy consumption will increase? Or do you believe that energy consumption will depend on the energy mix? I think it's pretty clear as the votes come in that our audience is quite savvy. And I think most of them have hit upon the right answer. In fact, the right answer is three. It depends on the carbon content in the current energy mix and how mitigation policies will change the energy mix over time. The Republic of Mitigation is at a good starting point. Even with no new policies on carbon pricing, improvements in energy efficiency were already underway. As a result, the carbon intensity of GDP was set to decline by 13% even, as Chen mentioned, GDP was expected to grow by 25%. A gradual increase in carbon pricing reduces the relative cost of renewables for energy supply and power generation, making them an even more attractive choice for consumers and energy producers. Energy prices and consumption can be insulated from the negative effects of carbon pricing by a range of policy responses that affect the energy mix. These include shifting from coal to gas and to renewables, coupling fossil fuel power plants with carbon capture and storage, and importantly, efficiency improvements in power generation. In the Republic of Mitigation, our estimation shows that the proposed carbon pricing scheme, a gradual increase in carbon prices to $75 per ton by 2030, would lead to a tripling of the share of renewables in the power sector by 2035, mainly by phasing out coal and reducing reliance on natural gas. Notably, total electri electricity consumption remains similar. But perhaps Chen can tell us how carbon pricing impacts households. Thanks, Irene. How does a specific carbon pricing policy impact households? This is one of the most important questions when designing a mitigation policy package. Our next poll asks which death cells of households experiences the largest reduction in consumption due to carbon pricing in the Republic of Mitigation. One, the top death cell of households by consumption, or two, the lowest death cell of households. As we see the results coming, it looks like most of all our respondents think this policy could be regressive. Um, that probably reflects somehow a, a worry about the impact it will be on vulnerable population. Um, actually, a well-designed carbon pricing scheme can be progressive, especially if paired with the right redistributive policies. Higher carbon prices directly impact households through higher costs of fossil fuel consumption and indirectly through the pass-through of, um, of the higher fossil fuel prices to prices of other products and services households consume. 
in addition to being an efficient tool for mitigation, carbon taxes can also raise extra revenue that can be redistributed to the poor and vulnerable households. Or this extra revenue can be used to reduce other distor distortionary taxes and improve overall efficiency. Put simply, carbon pricing can be both pro-poor and pro-equity. Let's see how this plays out across decils in the Republic of Mitigation. The chart shows what happens when carbon revenue is used to reduce labor taxes and increase social assistance for the bottom four decils. We assume that 25% of the carbon revenue is spent on social assistance and 75% for the reduction of labor taxes. The white diamonds stand for the net impact of household consumption. Under this policy package, the bottom four decils are better off from the carbon taxation, while the top three are worse off. Therefore, the net impact of this policy mix is pro poor. It shows that this policy package can channel more resources to improve the economic welfare of the poor and vulnerable, meanwhile disincentivizing greenhouse gas emission for all. Now that you have a glimpse into the impact on the economy and households, let me pose another question. Can mitigation, which is a global public good, also benefit local communities? Do you think the answer is yes, it can, or no, it cannot? It looks like we have more respondents agree that um, the mitigation can also benefit local communities. We have even more coming in to agree on that. Let's see um, if this is true, we'll see how the lo uh, local communities can be benefited. Mitigation policies have important local benefits, especially since burning fossil fuels cause significant air pollution. My colleague Simon can tell us more. Cutting fossil fuel use by carbon pricing and environmental taxation can help cut these air pollution costs. For example, if all countries price fuels efficiently, it would save about 1 million lives every year by 2025. Carbon pricing also has other benefits for development. Here are the 17 sustainable development goals countries are committed to. Carbon pricing can contribute to all of these goals. Firstly, by cutting environmental externalities, and secondly, by being a critical source of revenues. Now, when we come to monetize the local benefits of improved air quality and others, it means in aggregate carbon pricing tends to be in countries' own interests, even if they don't care about climate. Let us go back to the Republic of Mitigation. Gradually reaching a carbon price at $75 per tonne by 2030 reduces local air pollution, as well as traffic congestion and road accidents. The monetized carbon benefits and development co-benefits of this carbon pricing scheme can reach 1.6% of GDP by 2035. So one thing we hope you remember about our discussion of the Republic of Mitigation is that there is a scope for bold action on mitigation, including carbon pricing. If the overall policy package is carefully designed and the country's social objectives are clearly articulated. Beyond mitigation, countries also face the challenge of adapting to climate change. Countries need to design policies that shield their people and economies from climate change risks, now and into the future. Rising sea levels, more frequent or ferocious nature disasters, and encroaching desertification are just examples of climate change impacts that are already upon us. While mitigation aims to curb climate change, there is a very real risk that climate change impacts will continue to worsen. So countries need to adapt. Before we dive into another case study, my colleague Emanuele will explain what we mean by adaptation. Using the words of the International Panel on Climate Change, we say that in human systems, adaptation is the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. 
in order to moderate harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. Central in the IPCC definition is the notion that to adapt to future climate, we must start from adapting to present climate. Adaptation to climate change is then a process by which decision makers update expectations about climate as time goes by, using both observations and climate projections. It is not a one-shot game. It is a continuous process of adjustment. Since there is uncertainty about the future climate, there is also uncertainty about the best policy response. Using present climate risks as a starting point is the way to go. However, some big questions remain. How do you convince policymakers to spend for the future when they have so many urgent spending priorities that require attention right now? Building resilience against the nature disasters or climate change in the future can seem less urgent than helping families struggling with higher food prices. In practice, however, climate vulnerable countries have needs for both. We invite you to think about these questions through another hypothetical country example. Consider an island country named Adaptland. Adaptland is a middle income country with a small and not so diversified economy. Public debt has recently soared due to decreased revenue and increased spending needs associated with the pandemic responses. Most of its land mass is less than one meter above sea level leaving it vulnerable to sea level rise. It also faces frequent and increasingly intense tropical cyclones. The impacts of tropical cyclones include strong wind and coastal flooding. The degree of the impact depends on the intensity of the event, the vulnerability of the country, and the general disaster preparedness. Assume that in adapt land, a one-off extreme climate event destroys 10% of capital and causes productivity loss across sectors. And assume that climate change could induce a sequence of extreme events within a relatively brief period, hitting the economy before it is able to fully recover from the earlier event. The consequence is that the damage could accumulate over time, weighing permanently on the economy. Now that we have some context about Adaptland, here's another question. Intuitively, both public and private sector have a role to play in meeting adaptation challenges. In practice, households and firms can sometimes be more efficient than the governments in providing adaptation, but often they cannot do it alone. So the question is, at what point should the government intervene? One, when the private sector cannot adapt. Two, when the private sector undersupplies adaptation. Or three, private sector adaptation efforts sometimes do not sufficiently protect the poor and the vulnerable. Let's see what the audience's responses are. So now we have an almost even split between the second and third option. Looks like nobody is uh, agree with the first opinion. Let's review. Okay. So this is actually a tricky question because the government may step in under all three scenarios. First, compared to mitigation, adaptation is mainly a private good. But some types of adaptation actions have large positive externalities. Example might include investments in, food, in flood res resilient infrastructure or research and development of drought resistant crops. The private sector might underinvest, so government intervention might be warranted. Second, market inefficiency exists, including barriers to credit and to trade and efficient risk pricing to promote market efficiency and bring in the private sector, government intervention and often government spending may be needed. Third, equity issues must be considered. Climate change already disproportionately affects the most vulnerable, 
adaptation policies should reduce inequality rather than worsen it. And governments should step in to ensure that this is the case. Irene will tell you more about how governments can make adaptation plans. Thanks, Chen. National adaptation plans, or NAPs, are being developed, adopted, and updated by countries to guide adaptation policies as required by the Paris Agreement. As ADAPTLAND formulates its own NAPs, policymakers will likely want to learn from other countries' completed plans. So here's another question for you. Do you know how many countries have complete, completed the NAP process so far? Do you think it might be less than 25 countries? Between 25 and 50 countries? Or perhaps you're really optimistic and you think it's between 50 and 75 countries. Well, I see that so far our crowd isn't quite so optimistic and those of you who think it's less than 25 countries are ahead. We'll tell you in a second what the right answer is, but it's clear that most countries need to be somewhere along this path soon. In fact, the answer is at least 52 countries had completed their NAPs as of March 2022. According to the UNFCCC, there are four building blocks for NAPs. First, assessing climate change risks, including the hazard and the vulnerability of the country exposed to the hazard. Second, finding adaptation solutions tailored to those risks. Third, mainstreaming adaptation into development planning and implementation, including at the sectoral levels. Fourth, monitoring, evaluating, and reporting on adaptation actions to collect further cost-benefit information. This can help plan future investments for adaptation as well. Each of these building blocks makes up a step forward in the NAP process. All but a handful of countries that signed on to the Paris Agreement have taken at least one step toward for formulating and implementing their NAPs. More than 100 signatories have completed three out of the four steps. And there are at least 52 countries who have completed national adaptation plans and have them ready to be implemented. Chen can tell us more. Thanks, Irene. Let's go back to Adaptland. Earlier, we discussed that sometimes substantial investments are needed for adaptation, like building resilient infrastructure. And this requires government's intervention. Policymakers from Adaptland are seeking donor funding to implement their national adaptation plan. Adaptland has a relatively efficient public finance management system and is a frequent recipient of donor funding for climate. But of course, donors also have limited funding and need to prioritize. So imagine you are a donor that regularly provides funding to adapt to adapt land's climate work. Given limited funding, what type of financing should you, the donor, prioritize? Is it financing for more resilient infrastructure now to protect against future disasters? Or two, financing for reconstruction after the next disaster strikes? It is interesting that we see our audiences agree that financing for more resilient infrastructure now makes more sense. This has a, um, maybe a good understanding about how adaptation policy should work. We'll explain. So actually, both approaches make sense for donors, especially when nature disasters have already occurred and reconstruction and recovery are urgently needed. However, acting before disasters occur has a much bigger payoff. Building resilience into infrastructure up front will significantly reduce the costs of nature disasters in the future. Of course, this requires more government spending now when fiscal space may be already extremely tight. This underscores the urgency of increasing donor financing 
for resilience and sustainability and the meaningful impact this can have on longer term economic stability and growth. Let's see what my colleague Giovanni has to say about assessing this trade-off. This figure shows the inputs responses of GDP during the investment accumulation phase and in response to a one-off natural disaster shock. The blue line shows the case when the government invests in standard infrastructure capital, the red line when the government invests in resilient capital, the black line when the government invests in resilient capital and the initial cost is covered by international grants. Investing in resilient capital yields a GDP dividend even before the natural disaster occurs. The higher return on investment is determined by the superior durability of resilient infrastructure and its higher gross return. But it is in the post-disaster phase that resilient infrastructure displays its most important benefits. GDP declines about 1.2% in the case of resilient infrastructure and about 3% in case of standard infrastructure. If the economy has only standard public infrastructure, the tax pressure would have to be twice as large than the case in which damages are less severe thanks to resilient capital. And this fiscal adjustment could be unfeasible in practice. Clearly, if the initial investment in resilient capital were to be financed by donors, this would eliminate the need for additional revenue mobilization in the initial investment phase. The benefits of investing in resilient infrastructure now will be even greater if adapted land faces a repeated cycle of nature disasters, followed by recovery, which could make reconstruction longer and more costly each time. IMF staff estimates that when facing more frequent disasters, resilient infrastructure has significant benefits when compared to the standard infrastructure with no resilience component. These benefits include higher output, more private investment, and a reduction of public debt and taxation need after disasters. It is worth noting that the benefits of investments in resilience accrue even in absence of climate change. Upgrading to more resilient infrastructure can reduce maintenance costs and increase productivity. So as a donor, Stepping up and financing resilient infrastructure before the next disaster hits would be wise. We hope that these country examples have helped you understand a bit more about the principles of formulating efficient mitigation and adaptation policies and how they might, how they might apply to concrete policy questions. However, understanding policy principles is not enough. Irene will tell you more about what else is missing. To develop the right policies to address climate change, policymakers need to have the right information. They need insight into the financial, physical, and transition risks posed by climate change. And they need to know what other governments are doing. To preserve financial stability and make sound decisions, Businesses, investors, and financial institutions also need to understand the risks associated with climate change that affect their balance sheet. And they also want insight into the financial backing put towards the support of low carbon economies. In short, decisive climate action requires climate data and a robust information architecture for generating and sharing that climate data. First, high quality, reliable and comparable data to assess risks and foster sustainable finance markets. Second, a harmonized and consistent set of climate disclosure standards. And third, globally agreed upon principles for sustainable finance classifications that align investments with climate goals. Recent reports by the Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS, and the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, have highlighted persistent gaps with respect to climate-related financial information. They call for more forward-looking and granular data, as well as better verification and audit mechanisms. There's also a need to improve data accessibility. Major impediments are, first, the costs of collecting and reporting information, especially for small and medium enterprises, 
which often lack the systems and processes to collect data along complex supply chains, and second, the multitude of existing reporting frameworks that make the provision of consistent and comparable data challenging. So what initiatives are underway to help bridge these gaps? Through its Bridging Data Gaps workstream, the NGFS is assessing data availability and is building a repository of data needs, recording use cases, metrics and raw data items. The IMF's Climate Change Indicators Dashboard brings together climate-related data needs for macroeconomic and financial policy analysis. More about that later. The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, has published proposals enhancing and amending its framework, particularly around metrics related to transition risks such as Scope 3 emissions. As my colleague Felix just explained, High-quality, reliable, and comparable data is the scaffolding needed to build the climate information architecture. Launched in 2021, the IMF-led Climate Change Indicators Dashboard is an essential tool. The dashboard is an international statistical initiative to address the growing need for data in macroeconomic and financial policy analysis to support climate change mitigation and adaptation. In a single, easy-to-navigate online platform, it brings together experimental climate change indicators that allow comparison across countries. The indicators have been developed in cooperation with international organizations and other agencies, including the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the World Bank Group, the United Nations, the European Commission, the European Statistical Office, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Energy Agency, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States. Mahmoud explains why, what, typic, what types of indicators are available in the dashboard. The objective of the Climate Change Indicators Dashboard is to provide a platform for disseminating climate change data for macroeconomic and financial policy analysis. In collaboration with other international organizations, the fund has identified and developed a range of distinctive indicators available through climatedata.imf.org. Starting from the homepage, we can see indicator groups arranged into five broad categories. Economic activity indicators, cross-border indicators, financial and other risk indicators, government policy indicators, and climate change data. Each category and indicator group are clickable to allow users direct access to the data. Okay, now let's play with the dashboard and see what it can do. One often used financial indicator on the dashboard is the share of carbon footprint adjusted loans to total loans in deposit taking financial institutions around the world. Think of it this way, the lower the share, the greener the financial institution's loan portfolios. So which country has the greenest financial institution loan portfolios? Do you think it's Ireland, Costa Rica, France, or Switzerland? It's interesting to see as these responses come in because these countries are really scattered across different regions and even income groups. But I see that Costa Rica's reputation for protecting the environment precedes it, and so it's garnering a lot of the votes. Indeed, our audience is not so far off. All four countries have low carbon intensity in their loan portfolios, with Switzerland being the lowest according to this presentation of the indicator, which is still being refined but is based on emission intensities. The chart underscores that the carbon intensity of loan portfolios varies widely across countries and regions. However, it provides some valuable insights for policymakers by allowing them to understand what other countries are doing when they face similar challenges and also allowing them to learn from their peers as they formulate their plans for action. The dashboard also has a rich set of indicators on green bonds issuance. Chen can tell us more. Thank you, Irene. So green bonds 
help contain the economic and social impacts of climate change through market-based means. The dashboard supplies valuable information on green bond issuance by type of issuer. In 2021, a total of $620 billion in green bonds were issued. As you can see, in just five years, sovereigns and state-owned entities increased issuance from $17 billion in 2016 to nearly $150 billion in 2021. You might be asking, which sovereigns? The dashboard provides this type of insights too. Let me ask you another question. Which country had the highest sovereign green bonds in uh, issuance in 2021? Is it China, France, Nigeria, and United Kingdom? As the results come in, we see um, United, United Kingdom is temporarily leading the board. And we see a split, um, even split between France and Nigeria. It's interesting. Okay, in a minute we see the correct answer. If you guess the France, you are not far off. France has been con a consistent issuer of sovereign green bonds since 2017. However, in 2021, the largest issuer was United Kingdom at $21 billion. There are plenty more insights to be discovered throughout the dashboard and still more under development. Those insights are valuable to policymakers and stakeholders because they allow us to, dis, uh, to discuss climate change policy responses from a shared starting point, grounded in a collective understanding of the facts. Irene, do you want to wrap up? Sure, Chen, thanks. And thanks to our audience for your time today. Chen and I have really enjoyed interacting with you and hope that this peek into training leaves you with a few thoughts. First, our hope is that you come away with a better understanding of why climate change issues are at the center of macroeconomic and financial policy, as well as at the heart of the IMF's mission. It should be no surprise then that we develop this course to train policymakers in our member countries on these topics. Second, we walked you through the complex and critical issues of mitigation and adaptation. Our goal was to help you understand the economic and fiscal policy challenges posed by climate change and how those relate to formulating policy responses for both mitigation and adaptation. Third, we showed you a piece of our toolkit, the IMF-led Climate Change Indicators Dashboard. It is already publicly available, so we hope you will visit the site to play with the charts and indicators for yourself. For many of our country teams, this has already become one of their go-to tools when thinking about climate. We hope it will be the same for you. So what's next? Well, if you liked what you saw, we are happy to tell you that more is coming your way soon. The IMF's Institute for Capacity Development, with the generous support from the government of Japan, has recently launched the first of its series of six edX courses on the macroeconomics of climate change. This will be followed by a complementary set of regional training courses. We hope you will sign up and that you will encourage your colleagues and friends to do the same. Thanks again for joining us and see you on edX soon.